you know, the old rule, he who has the gold makes the rules, it still applies. And I think when all is said and done, China will price gold at much higher levels because they own the majority of the gold worldwide with central banks. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira, part of the outreach team of Silver Bullion here in Singapore where we want to help you truly secure your wealth. Bill Holter joins us today. Bill was a stockbroker for some 23 years, and he then joined with Jim Sinclair in the Holter-Sinclair collaboration from 2015 to 2022. And Bill is known as a longtime precious metals expert, and as such, he is also a broker for Miles Franklin and hosts his own website offering commentary and insights in on the precious metals markets at www.billholter.com. And we're delighted to have Bill join us once again today. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Bill Holter. Bill, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? I'm well. Thanks for having me back, Patrick. Thanks for uh, giving us your time again. Really do appreciate it. And I, I want to start off with uh, some commentary from your website, billholter.com. It was noted that the Federal Reserve reported that the largest year-over-year -year rise in history of the velocity of the M2 money supply occurred. Uh, Bill, two things. First, how would you describe the velocity of money for the viewers? And second, how in a time of rising rates uh, do we see the velocity of money rising? Right. Uh, well, first off, velocity is basically the turnover of money. Uh, it's how quickly it changes hands. And this is something I've commented on for uh, probably a dozen years or more, is that velocity of the dollar has continually, you know, with a few blips, but has continually gone downward. Uh, so the, the, the turnover of money has been slower and slower over the years. And my commentary over the past years has been, once you see velocity turn up and we are seeing it turn up now it remains to be seen whether that's going to continue but if it does continue when velocity turns up my my forecast is that is basically the end of the dollar as the reserve currency because what i think is happening is uh, especially with foreigners they're looking at the dollar as a hot potato they in many cases no longer need these huge reserves of dollars to settle trade. So what they're doing is they're simply selling them. Uh, they're getting out of the dollar. And, and you've kind of seen that. You've seen a, the dollar come down from uh, one, what, 113, 114 uh, on the USDX, which again, that's only a measure of currency versus currency. So it's it's uh, fiat versus fiat. It's It's not versus something real. Uh, but the dollar had dropped uh, a week or two back down to the 99 level. So, you know, you're looking at close to a 15% drop in value versus foreign currencies. And what I think you're seeing is foreigners are dumping dollars and that's creating, uh, it's creating a big movement of dollars. And that's what velocity measures. Okay, so so with this, I mean, if the velocity kicks up, uh, do you see the Fed having to actually start raising rates even more? That's possible. Uh, the other the other side to that equation of having to raise rates even more, uh, the U.S. just had a credit downgrade by Fitch. There may be others. Uh, they should have been downgraded long, long ago. But what they, the, the whole idea here is there's more risk to owning uh, treasuries. There's risk to the U.S. system. There's risk... Uh, to the judicial system, there's risk politically. And historically, uh, the dollar has been the political safe haven. Now with all the strife everywhere you look in the US, there is political risk, there's also fiscal risk. So you may see weakness in the dollar, uh, or you, you, I think you are seeing weakness in the dollar because you've got countries, foreign countries, looking to move out based on risk in the U.S. Um, that's something that's not ever been in the past. The U.S. has always been 
the safe haven. So yeah, the Fed may be forced to raise rates, and the Fed, I think when all is said and done, the Fed is going to be the ultimate last buyer of of any and all resort of dollars. I think the, the Federal Reserve's balance sheet is going to explode from here. I mean, in 2007, 2008, I think their balance sheet was, what, uh, $800 billion and it rose to something like $9 trillion. And I just read an article talking about the the uh, Fed's balance sheet going to twenty trillion. It could go to thirty, forty, fifty trillion. Who knows? If they're the buyer of last resort, they're going to have to buy everything. They're going to have to buy all U.S. issued paper, and that would force them uh, to aid them doing that. It would force them to raise rates to slow the run on the dollar. Right. You know, speaking about that that uh, downgrade. Uh, Jamie Dimon recently said uh, it's ridiculous that other countries are rated higher than the U.S. when they depend on the stability created by the U.S. and its military. Well, what comes to mind when you hear this? Well, I mean, his comment, his comment basically is is correct. I mean, if the dollar is the world's reserve currency, how can there be other uh sovereign treasuries or sovereign central or foreign central banks, how can they have a better credit rating than the reserve currency? I mean, it really doesn't make sense. And I mean, if you look, uh, and I don't, I don't know what the yields are currently, uh, but I know a few months ago, Greek debt was actually paying less than U.S. debt. And how is that even possible? So, I mean, you've got, you know, you have uh, perversions, you know, in, in many areas of the financial markets. Okay, so we got a little bit of uh, turmoil brewing with the uh, currencies. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in an interview I, I had a while back with the fellow Texan, Daniel DiMartino Booth, uh, some time ago she said that the Fed will have to create a digital currency in the name of national security. So what then comes to your mind when when you hear this as well? Well, of course, that's a buzzword or buzz phrase, national security. And I'll add one more to it. They'll say that they've got to do it for national security uh, to protect our democracy. Uh, the, the long and short of the central bank digital currency does two things, both things for the powers that be, the government, whatever, uh, and both bad for individuals. First off, it will track everything that you do down to a stick of gum. So the government's going to know everything that you do. And for instance, you and I doing this interview, uh, we're bad guys. We're, we're talking, you know, uh, we're not talking or supporting the, the actual, you know, the, not the actual, but the, the, the current narrative from the government. We can have our, our bank accounts shut off overnight. And how are you going to live? So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is with a digital currency, uh, and, and not that you can believe all the numbers now uh, as far as money supply, uh, the amount of debt outstanding, et cetera, et cetera, the amount of gold that's in Fort Knox. I mean, there's all kinds of things that, uh, we're told, are they real or not? I don't know. Uh, but a digital currency will basically put a, a very dark curtain around the Federal Reserve, around the Treasury, and they'll be able to issue debt, uh, issue currency, and either not report on it or completely lie about it. So in my estimation, in my view, the, the central bank digital currency is a one-way street. It's 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 the street for the government and not for the people. If you're enjoying this interview with Bill Holter and I, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. And if you would like to learn more about why more and more people are choosing Singapore as a favorite place to diversify, store, and protect their assets, such as precious metals, please go to our website, www.silverbullion.com.sg, look for the storage tab, and click on Exclusive Singapore Jurisdiction. Right. And I think uh, some some congressmen actually know this. Uh, they have a bill, H.R. 1122 in Congress, known as the 
the CBDC Anti-Surveillance Act. And I'll just read through this a little bit. Uh, what they want to do is uh, prohibit the Federal Reserve and the Federal Open Market Committee from using any central bank digital currency to implement monetary policy. And in addition, the Federal Reserve Bank is prohibited from offering products or services directly to an individual, maintaining an account on behalf of an individual, or issuing a central bank digital currency directly to an individual. So, Bill, why are these... Uh, we have at least some congressmen who are thinking things through, and, and they do see that there needs to be some kind of stipulation or law regarding the reach of just what a CBDC or, or the Fed can do, things that you just kind of mentioned here. Well, I mean, i got a short answer for you uh, as far as those bills are concerned. Good luck with that. Um, I don't see any of those being passed. Uh, the reality is uh, the Senate, Congress, it's it's a uniparty system. They're all they're all in on it. So I don't see any way that that's that those bills are going to be passed. I mean, I I don't see uh, other than a complete financial collapse the non-issuance of central bank digital currencies. But on the other hand, a collapse, in my opinion, will bring a central bank digital currency forward. But I think the collapse, I, that will collapse also. That'll be, uh, you know, we've talked about reset one and reset two. That would be reset one. And I don't think a central bank digital currency after a collapse uh, will vast, will last very long. So, I, you know, I don't think they'll stop it. And I do think it will come. But I, And I think the way they're going to bring it is is immediately after the collapse of the financial system. And again, I don't think that that will last. I think it may only last a couple of weeks. It may last a couple of months. Um, I don't think it'll last much more than six months if it does come. Because Patrick, you have to understand, let me just uh, add to that. You have to understand that if we go to a central bank digital currency, at the same time, you're gonna have the BRICS nations with a gold backed currency. So which one will foreigners wanna use? Are they gonna to wanna to use something that's issued by uh, by an entity that is insolvent or by an entity that has gold uh, backing. I'm not talking about convertibility. You'll never see a convertible, uh, any type of convertible currency or central bank digital currency. But just the fact that uh, they have gold, any amount of gold backing the currency, uh, I, I think that will that will uh, do great harm to any unbacked currencies. Okay, yeah, that kind of leads me to uh, where I was looking at some of your, your past work and I came across something where, where I believe you said back in 2015 that China will flip the switch on the gold price. Now, dates, yeah, they're, the dates were hard to get, but the idea still remains. So in your view and, and with what we are hearing coming from the BRICS and this type of a gold-backed currency, is this the proverbial switch that is about to be flipped to light up the gold price? Yeah, ultimately, ultimately that will happen. Ultimately, uh, China and Russia have much, much more gold than they say officially. Um, I can't, I can't prove it with Russia, but I can prove it with China. All you have to do is look at the imports over the last ten or fifteen years and look at their internal production, which never leaves the country over the last 15 years. You're looking at over 25,000 metric tons versus the U.S. claiming that we have 8,300 tons, and there's not been an audit since, I think, 1956. Um, so in my opinion, the U.S. does not have the gold we say we have. China has way more gold than they say they have. And, you know, the old rule... He who has the gold makes the rules, it still applies. And I think when all is said and done, China will price gold uh, at much higher levels. And of course, that benefits them because they own the majority of the gold worldwide, you know, worldwide with central banks. So to see China come out and say, you know, we bid 25,000 uh, for gold and we're offering gold at 25,000, uh, they would do it in yen. 
I'm, I'm talking dollars now. And I mean, the number could be 50,000. The number could be anything that China decides. And the reason it will be anything that they decide is because they own the vast majority of it. Bill, would you say that uh, we are we are in a currency war right now? Oh, we've been in a currency war uh, for quite a few years. And we actually warned uh, years ago, I think it was, what, 2016, 15, 16, when they first started talking about using SWIFT as a weapon. Um, that was the beginning of the currency wars. Of course, the U.S. has uh, appropriated all of the Russian uh, Forex reserves. I mean, that is that is warlike. That is wartime footing, no matter how you look at it. Uh, so the, fa the fact that uh, the U.S. weaponized the dollar, weaponized the SWIFT system, gave China and Russia the... Uh, I guess it gave them the push to create their own clearing system. And look at the world now. Look at Saudi Arabia. They're accepting currencies other than dollars. So, yeah, there's no question about it. We're in a currency war, and we've been in one for the last few years. Hopefully it doesn't go to a hot war. Uh, but my guess is once things start to fail in the U.S., and I've said this for many, many years, when things do fail in the U.S., the powers that be are going to have to kick the table over. They're going to have to be able to, to point at something, and that something would be uh, basically our policies were working except for the nuclear war. Well, uh, I, you think it will get that far? I know. It, it's, it's, it, it's super scary. Well, do you think the, the powers – in the in the West, are going to just go down without a fight? Are they going to take the blame? They have to point at something. And I mean, you know, what kind of false, what kind of a false flag event uh, would need to be for the U.S. to or the for the West uh, to launch? You know, a dirty bomb blows up in Cleveland, or or you know, what have you? Who knows what type of false flag? But something big enough to elicit a nuclear response. I mean, it's uh, it's a scary thing. It's an ugly thing to think about, but I think it is something very real that you 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 have to think about. Okay, and um, I think we've heard Paul in the past say that uh, th there is a possibility that there could be more than one world's reserve currency. But uh, do you see the possibility of the the U.S. dollar and and some other currency being shared as a world reserve currency, or? Or really, we're just on this path where it, it's all or nothing. Uh, no, you could have you could have more than one uh, currency that's considered a reserve currency. The thing is, let's say that it's the BRICS and the dollar, or let's say that it's uh, the BRICS, the dollar, and the yuan, or or what have you. The dollar is failing, no matter how you look at it. So the dollar is exiting the system. It's not coming into the system. So whatever currency or currencies are coming into the system, those are going to be the ones that assume power. The dollar just, I mean, all you have to do is look at the financial numbers of the U.S. Treasury. We're already well over 125% debt to GDP. That is banana republic land financially. We are absolutely a banana republic when you look at us judicially. I mean, what are they doing with with Trump? They're 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 trying to tie him up with with indictment after indictment, and that stuff you would see out of Brazil or Argentina or Colombia or Venezuela or an African nation. That's something you would see out of a you know a, a true banana republic. The U.S. Uh, the dollar. Think of the dollar as the common stock of the United States. I mean, would you want to? Would you rather buy stock in the United States or in China? Which one's rising and which one's failing? And so, I mean, that's that's the analogy right there. Is that the dollar is the common stock, and it's in a it's in a, a bear market to a terminal event. Right. Um, we have uh, consistently in the news. We we have things coming out of the West, things coming out of the East. But but there's also a third leg in all of this, and and 
that would be what a lot of people would say is the World Economic Forum, the WEF. Uh, they have no sovereign land, no sovereign country, yet they have tremendous power. But why does this non-elected group of people have seemingly great power over much of the world? And how do they factor into what's going on with, let's say, the U.S. and China? Well, what what they've done is they've infiltrated uh, high positions. I mean, look what Klaus Schwab has done with DAs, district attorneys in the U.S. Uh, I mean, you know, he's got sway over congressmen, over senators. And it's the same way, uh, you know, in many nations in the world. Look at the, call it the British Empire, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Britain. Uh, think about the, the tyrannical moves of forcing people to get the vaccine. I mean, it's the whole thing. I mean, look look around you. The whole thing is a plan. And you're right. It is a plan by the World Economic Forum. It's a it's a, a depopulation plan. Uh, so, yeah, you're right. Uh, they don't have any, any lands, but they do hold sway, pretty good sway, uh, you know, over many nations in the West. And I, I keep pointing this out, I, mean, I think, over the last probably two or three months. All I can say is thank God for the Second Amendment. Because, again, look, I just mentioned, look what they did in, in Canada, Australia, New Zealand. The population had to comply. And the population was conned into complying here in the United States. But there's probably 30 or 40 percent of the population that said, kiss my ass you know, I'm not taking the vaccine. And they were able to say, kiss my ass because they have guns and they can protect themselves. Uh, Bill, I think you kind of touched on this, but uh, are the Federal Reserve and, and other central banks, perhaps in different parts of the world, are they taking us on this this designed, maybe even planned path for this new monetary system to, to come in where people are actually going to be, be begging them for things and we're going to be looking for things like universal basic income? Yeah, absolutely. I've said this. Well, actually, I first started writing. I retired late 2006 and I started writing early 2007. And one of my very first commentaries, and I left the country in 2006 thinking or or knowing in the back of my mind that we had big problems ahead. And one of my earliest writings was the 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 policies that were being put in place were too stupid to be mistakes. They had to be part of a plan. And I absolutely believe, uh, I mean, and you can see it. I think the, the it's been a plan all along. And I think the plan got derailed somewhat in 2016 when Trump won. Hillary was supposed to take over. And I don't think this nation would even look, uh, would resemble what it resembles now. Uh, and I mean, just look at the current policies that that the Biden administration has put into place. And just just a perfect example, the head of what the atomic uh, atomic power disposal agency was the guy who was running around the, the tranny that was running around stealing uh, suitcases out of airports. I mean, it's it, this is the whole thing is too, too stupid. And the policies that they're putting in place. I mean, they want to get rid of gas stoves. Really? Gas is a clean energy. There's just item after item after item, no matter what you look at, doesn't make sense. And a lot of people are waking up to this because it's too stupid. And for example, even Bill Maher came out the other day and just bluntly said, the Democrats are full of shit because, you know, the things they're saying, the things they want you to believe are you know, a third grader 30 years ago when they used to teach math and logic would understand. Today, it's a different story. I mean, you got kids in school in the sixth grade that can't add two plus two together. So, and again, that's even part of the plan is to uneducate or, or dumb down the population. And they're doing it on purpose. Yeah, um, I guess that's where we, we recently saw a, a hearing on censorship, uh, trying to be trying to be censored. And um. And I'm not trying to be political with, with anything here, but uh, it is what it is. And and so, Bill, I'm I'm getting a bit worried here with all these things going on. Tell me, tell the rest of us here, what do you think we should be doing? 
Well, you want to become as self-sufficient as you possibly can. Um, if we are going to go to a central bank digital currency, you want to get as much of your capital out of the system as possible. You want to own gold and silver because for 5,000 years, they have had value. They are money. Uh, if you need to liquidate some to put back into the system, then you know, you'll know you be able to do that. You'll have wealth to put back into the system to live. Uh, but for a spell, the system is going to go down. And I, I can say that confidently. I mean, it's a mathematical equation. Credit is going to cease at some point. The credit market will seize up. And when that happens, your grocery store is not going to have anything. So make sure you have food stocked. Uh, make sure a good thing to do would be to talk to local farmers. Will they take silver for eggs? Will they take silver for, for beef, for chickens, for pigs, what have you? Uh, make sure you, you secure some type of food supply that will last uh, certainly at least uh, three to six months and preferably a couple years. I mean, I think the the system down will last at least two weeks, maybe two months. Uh, who knows? Maybe it's going to be longer than that. Then you need, obviously, you need to be able to protect yourself. Uh, you need a, a clean, a way to clean or purify water. You need a power source. Uh, when you dial 911 or the fire department or whatever, you very well may get no answer whatsoever because they're home protecting their own families. So, I mean, the, the best thing I could tell you is become as self-sufficient as you possibly can. Yeah, great points. Um, <clears throat> do you think this is, uh, let's say, mostly for perhaps our U.S. viewers, or is this for everyone all around the world? This is worldwide, and the reason I say that is because still the U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency. When the dollar does collapse and when there is a, a credit crisis in the U.S., there's going to be a credit crisis all around the world. And the world runs on the dollar, it runs on credit, and it, it runs on the Western philosophy, if you will. Uh, if the U.S. goes down, the entire world goes down with it. And that's one of the reasons I moved back from Costa Rica. My Spanish got good enough to understand that they, they will smile at gringos because they like the money. Um, but they don't really like gringos. And I mean, I, I, I was able to, to be in a conversation with two or three different people and I could overhear conversations and I could overhear people, uh, you know, talking about gringos. So I, I, my thought process was when the system does go down, gringos are going to be targets in foreign nations. You know, if you don't look like them, if you don't sound like them, you're not one of them. And in Costa Rica, even if you just live on Social Security, that's your only means of income, you're considered rich, you're considered wealthy. So part of my decision to come back was knowing that the, the uh, Costa Rican Central Bank relies on the U.S. dollar. When the dollar goes down, that country will go down. Many, many, many countries will go down. So that that was that led to my decision to move back to Texas and, and go through this with, you know, shoulder to shoulder with like-minded people. Uh, Bill, last question here. I'm just going to offer up uh, two statements and, and I'd like you to choose one that, that fits you more. Uh, gold is wealth protection. Okay, that, that's one thing. Gold is wealth protection. Or would you choose a statement of gold is sound money and sound money is freedom? Uh, they're both true, but I'll give you my answer. Gold nor silver can ever bankrupt in a world that is bankrupting. Wow. Wow. Okay. All right. I should have asked you a third question there. That that's, that's better than, than the two I had. <laughs> but, uh, Bill Holzer, I, I, I tell you what, you gave a lot of, uh, some pretty fiery topics here. So I, I, I appreciate that. I think, you know, maybe you, you, you lit a, a bit of a flame in, in people to, to get them to understand with, with what's going on. Uh, so before we wrap up, can you let the people know how they can follow you, your work, and some of the services that you may provide? Sure. You can go to uh, BillHolter.com. Uh, you can contact me through that, uh, or you can contact me directly through my business email. It's B 
H-O-L-T-E-R, at Hotmail.com. All right, will do. Uh, Bill, I'd like to thank you once again for, for your time and your, uh, your, your insights, your expert opinions. I know you've been doing this for quite some time, and, and I appreciate that as well as a lot of people. So we'd, we'd like to thank you for that, and I hope we can do this again soon. Thank you, Patrick. It's been my pleasure. That was Bill Holter sharing his views on central bank digital currencies and where the monetary system is heading. To see more of Bill's views, please visit his website, www.billholter.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe, and share. All are greatly appreciated and help us tremendously. Audio-only versions of this interview can be found on iTunes and Spotify.